No, guys. When they are releasing no African acinorosus, what is happening? Let's let's draw this acinorosus right here. So let's make this acinorosus right here. Look, when you have when you make this okay, I'm making this acinorosus. Hold on. Making this one acinoral cells, right? So when you release acinoral cells, let's have this one acinoral, and they have this, this ligand is norepinephrine, right? And they have like seven membrane receptor pathway, right? Right? And then this seven membrane, seven membrane, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay. And this seven is bound with like GS, right guys? And the GS is bound with what? The G, this is g stimulatory signals, because remember, this is a beta one Ergenic receptor, right? Ergenic receptor. So, because of that, sympathetic on your heart, as a G stem is bound with your beta and your gamma, right? And they also bound to GDP, right? As soon as they bound with this, what happens? As soon as more happens, binds to the beta one ergenic receptor. This GS will get stimulated, and then they will release, they will leave this beta and gamma, and they're deep, because they were in the low energy molecules, so they were inactivated. But as soon as when Get stimulated. This GS will run with the. They'll try. They'll. They want high energy molecule. And as soon as they'll leave the GDP, and the GTP will come. And then these guys will go. GS is now running with this uh, uh, GTP because the high energy molecule is excited. It's going to go to the membrane. And what is going to do? Adenocyclase, right? There's a. Let me just make A and C here. It's going to intrinsic. It's going to stimulate the intrinsic domain of adenocyclase, and that will make what? What that will do? That will convert. ATP into cyclic, cyclic AMP, and the cyclic AMP will do what? Protein kinase A, it will activate protein kinase A, right? So this is what it will do, beta-1 energy receptors, okay? With this pathway, they are going to activate protein kinase A. So when the protein kinase A will be active, what is going to happen? Remember, it will go to sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, right? For the, and they, will, they will activate this L-type channels, right? L-type channels. In, especially if you ask neural cells, if I just quickly draw, like remember how the graph looks something like this? They will actually, whatever, they'll amplify this, the channels, right? They'll speed up this, amplify this, so the pre-potential slope, right? By, by doing what? By, by, by phosphorylating, the phosphorylating these channels, they'll speed up the channels. So because of that, they'll reach threshold much more faster, and they'll activate those L-type channels, so more calcium was coming. If the more calcium will uh, come in, what's going to happen? They will go, calcium is going to go and bind you into uh, troponin C, right? And then after that, I mean, we talked about this earlier, guys, but the basic rule here is that the more cross cycle bridges will form, more, more cross cycles will form. And if the more cross cycle is formed, if we talk about the SNRO cells, what's going to happen? You're going to happen positive chronotropic action. What do you mean positive chronotropic action? Well, that means if you positive chronotropic action basically means you're increasing your heart rate. And remember, what is it? Remember, guy, cardiac output is equal to what? Extra volume times heart rate, right? So remember, if you increase your heart rate, right? If you have positive control, okay, you increase your cardiac output. Sorry, you increase your heart rate. That means if you increase your heart, heart rate, if you increase your cardiac output. If you increase your cardiac output, you increase your mean arterial pressure. If you increase your mean arterial pressure, you increase your blood pressure. That is what is happening, right? Because we're trying to increase the blood pressure right now, right? Now, something else. They will also contract with the same sort of mechanisms of the beta-1 adrenaline receptor. They'll also do what? They'll do what? They will do... Uh, they will go and stimulate the uh, AV neural cells. That means the conduction will go up, right? Then when the conduction will go up, what's going to happen? Okay, if the conduction will go go up, that means uh, the electrical impulse that is going to the ventricle, my cardiac will be faster, right? That means these guys will able to contract, contract the contractibility will, will increase. That's what happens with the AV neural cells, right? Other thing is happen is that you talk about, let's talk about your ventricle myocardium. Again, the ventricle myocardium of beta 1 adrenaline receptors, right? Same this kind of pathway. They'll, they'll phosphorylate L type, L type, like if I have to make this, right? Remember this. I know they'll activate this L type, can, L type, fast L type channels, right? And when they amplify, what happens? More calcium will come in, right? So more calcium in cytoplasm, right? Which, which causes what? Which causes have increase in more cross-cycle bridges forms, and then you will have a positive inotropic action, which basically means you're more in contractibility happens. When you more, when you contract it, when you when you increase your contractibility, what happens? Okay, when you contractibility increase, that means you contractibility increase. If the contractibility increase, what happens? Your stroke volume goes up, right? If your stroke volume goes up, then what happens? Your cardiac output goes up, right? Because remember, 
if this contractor is high or stronger, you're going to increase the stroke volume. If the stroke volume is up, you increase the cardiac output. If the cardiac output is up, your mean arterial pressure is up. If your mean arterial pressure is up, your blood pressure is up. Right? That's what is happening here now. Or I can simply say, if your stroke volume goes up, what happens? Your cardiac output goes up. If your cardiac output goes up, your systolic pressure goes up. If your systolic pressure goes up, your blood pressure goes up. That is the whole idea of here. And then this is happening in the same, this is happening also in this side also. Both and both. Okay? Now that is one mechanism of this cardio axillary center here. Right? That's how you're trying to increase the blood pressure right now, right now. What is it having now? Now, okay. The two way of way of doing it, right? Now, now let's. Now, what is this vasomotor? It's also actually this vasomotor center, right? And this, what this vasomotor motor center does is they'll inhabit, okay? They'll inhabit vasodilator centers, but they will stimulate the vaso constrictor centers, okay? Look, guys, the vasomotor, they when the when the when the solar tract nucleus when they, they when you get positive symmetry vasomotor centers, which will activate the vasoconstrictor and inhibit the vasodilator because we want to constrict. Okay? And this vasoconstrictor, when they happen, what, what does it do? Okay, guys, come this. Okay, let's just go. Let's just talk about this. Couple of things. Okay. Obviously, these vasoconstrictors also have what? They give a descending fibers, remember? This give a descending fibers here, right? Your descending goes to the uh, goes to their couple of things, the lateral horns or sympathetic fibers, and gives it again post. I said it's a post uh, sympathetic ganglions, right? Sympathetic ganglions. I mean, right? So post sympathetic ganglions. And these guys have bunch of bunch of things. I remember one more thing. These guys also this is the car from the these basomotor centers. You know, it goes and you know what it does? It goes into this beautiful organ, right? Look at this. You know what this this basomotor center does? It goes. And then release acetylcholine too. I mean, sorry, this vasomotor center goes in the medulla, okay? Adrenal medulla it goes, and then what, what it does is stimulates this and releases epinephrine. And epinephrine is a hormone, right? It also helps release epinephrine from the vasomotor center, right? Because of that, remember, that's a sympathetic way, okay? The sympathetic way, sympathetic way, that put, uh, goes and then they will, uh, they will allow, they will go and stimulate this, uh, in a medulla, adrenal medulla actually, because this is a true adrenal gland, and adrenal gland has adrenal cortex and then adrenal medulla. This adrenal medulla is the one that is synthesizing epinephrine, right? When this vasomotor center goes and stimulates this, a lot of epinephrine will release, and this epinephrine does what? Again, the epinephrine will goes, and epinephrine can bind into SN neural cells because beta 1 receptor is there. They also go bind into AV neural cells, also the ventricular myocardium, and then if you go and bind to SN neural cell, what is going to happen? They increase the heart rate. When you increase the heart rate, you increase the cardiac output. Uh, when you the uh, cardiac output, you increase the blood pressure, right? That's what it's going to do. Same thing, same thing. It also goes to the ventricular myocardium and both the side, right? Then, what is what's going to do? You increase the heart rate again. If you're talking about my, uh, positive inotropy, right? You increase what you increase your contractibility, you increase your stroke volume. When you increase your stroke volume, you increase your cardiac output. When you increase your cardiac output, you increase your systolic pressure. When you increase your systolic pressure, you increase your mean arterial pressure. When you increase your mean arterial, you increase your blood pressure. That is what is happening here, right? Now, other thing this basic motor centers is going to do is that it goes to different you post uh, ganglions here right and you know what this guys do this guys this beautiful mechanisms here right this guys you know what they do this guys what do they do they come here they come on the arterial side right and then this arterial side okay if you're talking about scalar muscle you take the kidney right if you're talking about so the blood vessels, they contain this, like especially these arterioles, right? These arterioles have a lot of what? A lot of the circular small muscles and they're very, very rich in alpha-1 receptors. Alpha-1 receptors, guys, you have to remember this. Alpha-1 receptors, right? This guy very, very rich in alpha-1 receptors, right? So when this guy's coming, but these are smooth muscle cells, right? So when this guy's coming, with alpha, what is going to happen? These guys will, these guys will do what? These guys with these muscles, okay, let me erase this here right now, okay? You got this part, right? When these guys come in and release there, what are they releasing? Maybe norepinephrine they're probably releasing right from there, right? Norepinephrine, and you can say from the adrenal medulla, maybe epinephrine is coming there too, okay? And then even this is also seven past membrane receptor, okay? Okay, let me make these cells. This is a circular small muscle cells, right? And then this is also, let's make, let's make this a bit bigger. Okay, guys. So what is happening here is that these guys, Let's make this as a, right? What is happening here? They also seven pass memory receptor. Okay, I'm just making the seven, seven, maybe it didn't pass seven. But anyways, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, anyways. When the epinephrine, no epinephrine. But this is guys are doing. When the alpha one receptors, when they're, these guys are not, 
what these guys are not GS pathway these alpha one receptors i just want to make sure that i'm right about this uh these guys are going to be your alpha one receptors are going to be your gq pathway and this gq because they are going to use uh uh this they are going to use uh the uh gq pathway right and this gq pathway also bound with beta and gamma right beta and gamma so whenever this epinephrine or let's say norepinephrine with the alpha 1 receptor these are alpha guys these are alpha 1 receptor okay when this alpha 1 receptor comes in really what happens is they'll activate this and they were previously they were occupied with the gdp right when they get stimulated they will lose their low energy molecules which is, which is gdp and uh, and also they'll lose, lose beta and gamma and this will get the gq has what is called gtp and that's what they go this was guys will go and stimulate this enzyme which is on the membrane which is called phospholipase C enzyme, okay? And you know what the phospholipase, they're cutters. Phospholipase C has a two cutters. And this phospholipase is what they do is that they cut down this PIPT, which is phosphatidyl inhistyl biphosphate, and breaks down into two products, which is going to be IP3 and your DAG. And the DAG will go activate protein kinase, uh, in this case C, I think. All right? That's what these guys will do. Now, now, what is going to happen here? And this IP3 will go what? IP3 will go to like endoplasmic reticulum, right? And then what happens? This IP3 will force, like, because whenever I, they are very, very sensitive to these channels on the calcium channels on your sarcoplasm or endocular reticulum, right? And they will, let's say this is my channels right here, okay? And what happens? Like, there's a lot of calciums, okay? They're bound with this protein called uh, sequestrant protein, right? The calcium is a lot of calcium. And whenever these guys, when IP3 comes and works into this, what happens? What happens is that this calcium channel opens up, right? And then when the calcium opens, a lot of calcium comes in, co comes in here, like a lot of calcium is floating the side of, uh, on the side of, on the side of soil. But when that comes in, remember there's a one protein called calmodulin. What is called calmodulin? There are cal lots of cal calmodulin is is actually floating around in the cytoplasm. So what happens when the calcium bound it, bound it, it's sort of more, look, name of the protein, name of, name of the protein tells you what it is. It's a calcium modulator. This is what calcium modulator is. When it bounds, like, uh, uh, it bound, it bounds, uh, bound with the uh, calcium, it modulates the uh, calcium in such a way that, I mean, uh, so we call, we say what happened is that remember calcium in such a way that what it does is that there's an inactive myosin, let's say inactive, inactive myosin light chain okay myosin light chain light chain light chain so there's inactive myelin in matter such a way that this myosin light chain kinase will get activated and becomes your myosin light chain because this is a myosin light chain a myosin light chain kinase and remember so inactivated myosin light chain out of the calcium calmosylate in the camp k or we call them a camp k too Inactivated myosin, we put a uh, inactive myosin light chain, it activates uh, the myosin light chain and it becomes your myosin light chain kinase. Now, this myosin light chain is kinase. Whenever kinase is there, it's going to phosphorylate, right? Whenever it's phosphorylate, what happens that? Whenever you phosphorylate, it will, the myosin is able to bind on the actin so that way more cross cycle bridges forms and what happens will the, the constrictions will occur. Now, the, the constriction will This is what the smooth muscle, we're talking to the smooth muscle cells. Okay, so because they're circle, circular, because they're small muscle, we have to use this pathway of myosin light chain kinase pathway. Okay, now with this pathway, more cross cycle and the constrictions will happen. So when you constrict the arterias, right, with this pathway, with that one, epinephrine, you constrict the arteria. When you constrict the arteria, what is happening, guys? Here, look, erase this again. Okay, you probably got this part, right? So when you constrict the, the constrict the when you constrict here, okay, make it is this. When you constrict the arterial side, what is going to happen here? Okay, when you constrict the arterial, you are what are you you are what do you do? You're decreasing the diameters, right? When you decrease the diameter, what happens? You're decreasing the radius, right? Radius, right? You decrease the diameter. when you decrease the radius, what is happening? You're increasing the resistance, right? When you increase the resistance, what is happening? When you when you increase the resistance, you're increasing the maybe if you add all of them, you're increasing the total peripheral resistance, right? If you increase the total peripheral resistance, what is happening? You're increasing your diastolic pressure, right? If you're increasing your diastolic pressure, what is happening? You're increasing your blood pressure, right? No, look at this guys. 
look, when you constrict it, what is happening with the diameter of blood vessels? It is decreasing. When you decrease the blood vessels what is of the diameter, you're decreasing the what? You're decreasing the radius. When you decrease the radius, what is happening? You increase the resistance. When you increase the resistance, what is happening? You're increasing the total part of resistance. You have all the resistance, right? Of the, all the system circulation. When you increase the TPR, you increase your diastolic pressure. When you increase your diastolic pressure, what happens? You increase your mean arterial pressure. When you increase your mean arterial pressure, pressure, which is which also means that you're increasing your blood pressure. That's your that's what you happen on the arterial side, and we call them as a vasoconstriction, right? Now, 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 these supplies, these guys also have supplies here on here. On the these guys, these also have some receptors on the venous side because venous also have like a stone muscle cells. They have a stone muscle. They also do something called veno veno constrictor. Guys, when you consider, remember these guys. The venous is usually because their wall is thin, right? And the wall is thin because of that, they're always holding more volume of blood. And about like 70 or 60 to 70 percent of your blood is in the vein, right? So when you do venous constriction, so when because of this, venous constriction happens, what happens? You, you decrease the diameter. When you decrease the diameter, you decrease the radius. When you decrease the radius, you increase the resistance. Sorry, right? So when you give venous constriction, right? So because of that, when you venous constriction, you constrict it. Decreasing, right? So your powerful constrict, what happened? What if the blood you decrease radius? There's more. So what is happening? Okay, so let's you constrict it, right? So when you constrict, what is happening? You, 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 there's more resistance into it, right? So what is going to happen to the your venous return? Venous return will go up, right? So that means there will be increase in your venous return, correct? So with the venous constriction, decrease radius, right? Remember, decrease radius. Decrease radius. That means what's going to happen with this? The more pressure you'll generate, right? So this was we call it unstressed volume will be will come out and go much more faster here, right? So venous constriction by giving here the venous constriction will will return the so there will be increase in venous return. If you increase in venous, venous return, what is going to happen to the cardiac output? If you increase the venous return, what is going to happen? There's more filling on the ventricles. When you have more filling in the ventricles, you have more increase in cardiac output. When you increase the cardiac output, you increase your systolic pressure. When you in increase your systolic pressure, you increase your blood pressure. So that is also one way to regulate your blood pressure, right? Because remember, right now we are all trying to increase your blood pressure. Okay, that is what is happening now. Now this is a neuronal way of like uh, uh, increasing your blood pressure, right? Now, what is the other way to, and this short terms, now, what else is going to happen? Now, so far we talk about the, how neuron will able to, uh, with the neuro neurological controls, how they increase the blood pressure. Remember one more thing, we talked about cardiac center, we talked about the basal motor center. Remember, we didn't talk about cardiac inhibitor center. What does cardiac inhibitor center usually do? Cardiac inhibitor center, usually what it does is that it goes, okay, gives the nerves, because remember this one, come all the way down and gives here nerves, with the, it goes to the cardiac plexus, right, and gives the post-sympathetic fibers to here, to the SA nodal cells, Right, it goes gives a V neural. Okay, look, it's a left vagus nerve which supplies a, a so right vagus nerve. Okay, let's say right vagus nerve gives a nerve fibers to S A node, and your left vagus nerve goes an A V node, right? And then remember, the vagus nerve or the acetylcholine does not release into what is this called in the ventricle myocardium, right? And same thing is happening here too. Okay, it goes to S A node. Okay, uh, I mean sorry, this let's say this is my left. Let's say this is my uh, let's say this is my atrial myocardium, and let's say this is my left. Uh, Vegas now we see going to AV node, right? Now what is that going to happen? Because usually what happens with the GI pathway, right? GI pathway, what happens is that these guys usually release acetylcholine, right? Acetylcholine. But because if it's inhibited, what happens if it's inhibited, you're not able to release acetylcholine into this, okay? And usually these guys are, uh, if you're not able to release, which is usually with the M2 receptors are there, right? With the GQ, GI pathway, there'll be less protein kinase, like, I mean, there's be less cyclic AMP. There's a less cyclic AMP, because I'm not going to the pathway, but you guys already know the protein kinase, right? Because, it, so, based on the M2 receptor, so that what happened? What happens is that, if it's inhabited, so you do not, it do not able to uh, bring your heart rate down, or it, uh, or it do not able to decrease your conduction. That's why because it's inhabited, right? So that is the other way. So this is also I talked about that one. Now, now we are talking. We are talking about some of this stuff, stuff too. Now, this is again. Now this is the neural neuronal control. But remember, we talked about there is a, a way to control, right? With the blood vessels, how they that how it increases your. Uh, uh, contractibility and all that stuff, right? But sometimes, you know, what these guys have, these guys also have something called like, you know, endothelin derived, you know, endothelin derived some factors. So what are they called? They're called endo, endothelium derived some factors. What does that mean? What that means is that, look, whenever there's blood pressure is low, right? 
What is happening? Whenever there's a blood pressure is low, the blood pressure is low. What is happening? Whenever the blood pressure is low, what is what is going to happen is that these guys, this these arterials have this their intrinsic property to work in based on that. You know, so what these guys do is that uh, to maintain the blood pressures too. What these guys do is like you know, they can release some of the uh, some of the compound. Okay, uh, these are called local metabolites. So if you if you want to increase the blood increase the increase the blood pressure, these arterials are the, from the uh, uh, circular muscles or endothelial cells. They uh, they release some some product called endo endothelin. Okay, or they also call thromboxin, uh, th uh, thromboxin, right? So if they release thromboxin, right? If they release thromboxin, if they end the they'll go cause constrictions. If they cause a constriction, what is going to happen? You decrease radius. When you decrease radius, what happens? You increase resistance. When you increase resistance, what happens? You increase torque pressure resistance. When you increase torque pressure resistance, you increase your diastolic pressure. When you increase your diastolic pressure, you increase the mean arterial pressure. That's all. The, this is a local factor for them to actually control uh, or regulate your blood, your blood pressure too. Okay. So, and then, other thing is that, uh, what, what also happens is that, so you remember hormonal, hormonal, we talk about hormonal. So whenever there's a low blood pressure, what happens is that, you know, this atria and this ventricle, their walls are very, very sensitive with certain things. Okay? So, whenever there's a pressure is not high or the blood volume is low, what happens is that there is a, usually the, they release this product in here. Okay? And that product is called A and P, and then they also call B and P. Okay? It's called atrial natriuretic peptide and then brain natriuretic peptide okay BNP usually these ones are product by your atrial cells especially your right atrium okay right atrium okay now tell you what this does and then BNP is actually the products by your 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 uh, what they do is these guys usually by the ventricles and the role of ANP is what well, this guys work in a couple of places okay one of the things the ANP works into, one of the functions of ANP is that, okay, they do vasodilations of the blood vessels. Okay, vasodilation of blood vessels, that's what they do. They inhabit those renin pathway, right? Renin pathway, usually that's what they do. And they also uh, helps to like, uh, to prevent returning or helps to like, uh, you know, uh, prevent from, from return, uh, retaining Sodium and water. This is guy usually do. Remember, because if you prevent from retaining sodium and water, that means the blood volume will both blood volume will be, will be a lot less, right? Uh, so usually these guys play come in uh, play a role usually when the pressure is high. But we're talking about low blood pressure. So because there's no stretch on this uh, atrial valve because the, there's a decrease in blood volume or there's a decrease in pressure because there's no stretch into these guys. So really, what happens is that this guy uh, does not release ANP much so that way uh, because we're trying to increase the blood pressure right so because of that they also play a role into uh, uh, maintaining or increasing blood pressure by not releasing uh, the ANP or BNP okay that's the thing now you know guys uh, let me quickly talk about uh, the role of this uh, now now let me quickly talk about this role of this the chorotic body as well right chorotic bodies or aortic bodies right these chorotic bodies and aortic bodies are very, very important. And also one more thing, by guys, the chorotic sinus, like, you know, usually they respond up to, let's say, 50 millimeters of mercury, okay, when the pressure falls up to that. Okay, then after that, because they don't even sense it, okay. And for the aortic sinus, they sense it up to like 30 millimeters of mercury of the pressure. That's what these guys say, and they'll fire. Uh, you know, that's the lowest they can, they can go. Now, uh, other thing that I want to talk about, the, this chorotic body and aortic bodies. This chorotic bodies and aortic bodies, are very very sensitive to let's say chorotic body we're going to put that one right they're very very sensitive to low O2 okay excessive okay what is this excessive carbon dioxide or you can say like H plus concentration when you have high concentration what happens that means it's very acidic right so that's it that's what it is so like pH level the end okay let's just make it because it's a peripheral okay uh, so these ones are peripheral the peripheral chemoreceptor, peripheral chemoreceptor, sorry, 
the pair for chimera sutras okay so this guy's a very very sensitive to low oxygens okay and usually when it falls like from like up to like 80 millimeters of mercury this guy's uh upgrade your blood pressure usually these guys come and play a role into it okay so this pair for chimera sutras okay whenever the blood pressure falls about like um, less than 80 millimeters of mercury this pair for chimera sutras sense it okay but you really what happens whenever this guy sense it what, what they what they do is that Obviously, from the from the nerves of glossopharynx and nerves, because remember, this uh, curved body is also innervated by this heading nerves, uh, uh, which is curved, curved body, and they send the, and they send the electric impulses. But you know, but this is a pair of chimera receptor, okay? And what this guy do is, when they when they when these guys come, because of low O2 and their high carbon dioxide level or high protein concentrations, what happens is that they will they will specially. Uh, stimulate the chemosensory, chemo, uh, the papal chemoreceptor come, come and st stimulate this uh, vasomotor center actually, specifically these vasomotor centers. And when they, they stimulate the vasomotor center, what happens? You know the path, right? It will allow to have, it will go and do the arterial constriction and then the vena constriction. So when you do the vena constriction, you increase the venous return. When you increase the venous return, you increase the cardiac output, okay? Uh, and then when you increase the uh, arterial, when you constrict the arterial, uh, you uh, you increase the resistance, and when you increase the resistance, you increase the TPR. When you increase the TPR, you increase your diastolic pressure. When you increase your diastolic pressure, you increase your mean arterial pressure. When you so when you maintain your mean arterial pressure, obviously your blood pressure goes up, right? That's what these guys these guys do. Okay, and other thing is that if your pressure falls, let's say like about sixty millimeters of mercury, right? Okay, then really what happens is that sometimes what happens is that there's also the uh, sensors, which is basically what is it? Whenever, whenever the pressure is falling, let's not even think of it that way. Whenever, like, your, the, your, 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 let's say, like, hypoxia conditions or, uh, when you have, let's say, you have a very, very low O2, right? And you have a lot of CO2, right? Or you have a lot of H plus is floating around the body, right? So what happens is that your brain, because remember, the, whenever that, whenever this, whenever this case happens, really what happens is that, uh, you are, you are, uh, the flow, because remember, your brain needs nutrients and oxygen, right? So, whenever there's a decrease in flow to your brain, okay, there's a decrease in, and really what happens is that, remember, carbon dioxide is a lipid solver, right? So, when it goes, there's a, there's a chemo receptors are located in central medulla, okay? So, when the, when really what happens is that, uh, this O2, and specifically actually the carbon dioxide, because whenever there's a low blood flow, that means there's increase in carbon dioxide level in your brain, right? So, a brain, because, because remember, like H plus cannot, cannot cross the blood brain barrier, but CO2 can, because CO2 is a lipid soluble, right? So, when the lipid soluble uh, crosses, there's a lot more CO2 is built up, right? And then this CO2 get mixed up with water, and then what happens? It makes a carbonic acid, right? H2CO3, and then this H2CO3 breaks down into your H plus and your bicarb. Okay, that's right. And this H plus is going to stimulate the chemoreceptors on chemoreceptors. Okay, and when they stimulate the chemoreceptors, usually what happens is that this chemoreceptor will uh, will stimulate basomotor center, but at the same time it will also stimulate the stimulate look stimulate cardio inhibitory center also. This is very very important. It will stimulate the basomotor center. Okay, it will also stimulate cardiac inhibitory center. So if you have stimulated both basomotor center and cardiac inhibitory center, what is going to happen? With the vasomotor center, you're going to have increase in venous return. You that means you're going to have increase in cardiac output. Okay, the cardiac output. So you're going to increase in your you're going to have uh, increase in blood pressure, right? So when you but with the but they also do a powerful stimulation of cardiac inhibitory center. And if they do powerful uh, stimulation of cardiac inhibitory center, what happens? These guys go work and then what? S neural cells and AV neural cells, right? So when they go on S neural and AV neural cells, your heart rate goes down. Okay, this is called Cushing case, the Cushing syndrome or something. When you have both your 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 hypertension, okay, but at the same time your pulse pressure is going down. Your pulse pressure is going down. Okay, and this is usually happened because of the because your carbon dioxide is built up so much, and because of that, the chemoreceptors, the chemoreceptor is stimulate both cardiac inhibitory centers and also the vasomotor center. Okay, and and because there's a powerful stimulation of cardiac inhibitory centers, what happens is that. 
it will stimulate the SNRL cells so much that it will it will decrease your pulse pul pressure, right? And then because of the vasomotor center, you'll have a high, because of the stimulation of vasomotor centers and all, and also cardiac axial center, you'll have increase in uh, blood pressures. So increase in hypertension, you have increasing hypertensions and your pulse pressure. Okay, now guys, we talked a lot about these things, and we still have to talk about this. So far, we've been talking about short terms. We're gonna to, we have to talk about long term, which is going to be the renin, renin angiotensin system, and how does that help us to uh, increase the blood pressure. But before I finish this, okay, and be, and uh, I'm gonna talk about something called orthostatic hypotension. What does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? But before that, we'll talk about normal, and we'll talk about orthostatic hypotension. Ortho static hypotension okay first normal and then we'll talk about uh, first normal I'll talk about it because really what happened with auto service that happened in the basic means is that let's say when you when you are supine position and you suddenly get up when you suddenly get up what happens is that using normal case what happens is that you are all the all the blood goes to the peripheral or, or goes to the legs there right that means what happens is that when the part of the your venous return decreases, right? When your venous return decreases, you have a cardiac output that decreases, right? When suddenly that happens, what happens is that these guys senses, these guys, this, they, there's a less pressure into this a better receptor, and they sense it so fast that this they'll stimulate the vasomotor center and cardiac access centers, and they will modulate in such a way that you know they will, uh, they will, they won't they will allow to enough blood to go to your brain so that way you don't have syncope okay that way you don't have syncope or you don't fall down okay so the mechanism is so fast that even the when the blood rapidly falls and when suddenly get up you don't faint because this vasomotor centers and your uh, your cardiac center centers working so fast so fast and so well because of they help you to maintain uh, your blood pressures or blood pressure or that or, or your perfusion person i guess that's what it is but with certain people sometimes when you have let's say uh let's say you have a loss of blood volume okay when you have loss of blood volume loss of blood volume or let's say you give a venodilator as i said right loss of blood volume or venodilator um drugs right venodilator drugs or loss of blood volume then what happens is that even though or let's say there's a problem with the uh, the you're sympathetic. The cardiac access centers are various mentors. There's a there's a nerve problems. Okay, if that happens, then really what happens is that even though let's say we'll use a loss of blood volume. Okay, so you you have a loss of blood volume, or like a dehydration, a severe dehydration. So you have a, let's say because uh, you have a cholera or a very very bad diarrhea, whatever. So because of that, you lost a lot of blood volume. When you have that, even though these guys who send fibers. And then uh, report of the the often fiber does go to the solid tractor's nucleus, and then solid tractor's nucleus. What does is that they will stimulate cardiac axis center and vasomotor centers, and they will inhibit cardiac inhibitory centers, uh, cardiac inhibitory centers, and the cardiac axis centers with the acinorals, or uh, avinorals, and then ventricular myocardiums. The contractor increase even with that too, or when it, with the vasomotor with the vasomotor center constricting the arterioles or uh, constrict the vena uh, the veins, which can increase the venous return. When you do that too, what happens is because it's, it's still decrease of blood volume, okay, because it's decrease of blood volume, then there will be still a decrease in cardiac output, okay? Because there's a decrease in, there's a loss of a lot of blood volume. Because of that, even with the contractibility increasing by this, uh, this cardiac access center the, with the sympathetic outflow, okay, with the releasing epinephrine and all, it's still there's not enough cardiac output that is generated. So because of that, you get something called syncope. You can faint or you can get blackout. Uh, that usually happens, all right? And that is usually called orthostatic hypertension, hypertension because there is not enough cardiac output generated because of lost blood volume be with the... Uh, with the sympathetic outflow, okay, and that is called orthostatic hypotension, right? So now, so far we talk a lot of things about it, right? Now we're gonna like end it here.